Welcome to the home edition of the Wednesday night Bible study from Barefoot Bay, Florida, River of Light Church. Now, if you have your Bibles handy, uh, turn to Luke chapter 9. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles and want to get it, then you can go ahead and pause this video and go retrieve your Bible and then come back and start again. Otherwise, you can just listen. That would be great too. This chapter, Luke chapter 9, contains a turning point event in the life of Jesus on earth. He's talking with his disciples and he's asking some questions that directly impact their understanding of exactly who Jesus is. And these are questions too that when they're asked of us might cause us to search our hearts and see where we stand. Luke chapter 9 beginning in verse 18. Jesus asked this question. He said, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and some say you are one of the other prophets, risen from the dead. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, of course, he's the first to reply all the time. <laughs> Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. Now this interchange leads to a mountaintop experience. We love mountaintop experiences in our Christian lives. These are times of emotional content, uh, excitement, th thrilling revelations, uh, great victories. God seems so near and so powerful. And when we encounter them, we want to stay there. We don't want to leave. We want to continue to experience that mountaintop time with God. Now I used to read about Jesus' transfiguration in Luke chapter 9 and I used to wonder, well what's that all about? But now I have a better understanding. This has been an important milestone in my journey from law to grace. This event, uh, the transfiguration event, takes place about three years into the ministry of Jesus on earth. So we're going to continue in Luke chapter 9 down to verse 28. About eight days later, and that's eight days after the conversation we just talked about, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Now in Matthew 17, Matthew's account of the same event adds to it a little bit. It says Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Powerful. Then, the, then two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world. They were talking about Jesus leaving this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Well, Peter and the others <clears throat> had fallen asleep, and when they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, oh, it's Peter again, yep. Peter, not knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters. Let's, let's build some little, little uh, houses and as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud came over them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone about what they had seen at that time. So we see in the Bible what people were saying about Jesus. We read about what Peter said about him. But none of this truly connected with the true purpose and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Up on the mountain, 
Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets and Jesus himself represented the Father. Remember what Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Here we hear what the Father says about who Jesus is. The highest authority comes from the Father. He said this about him, my son, my chosen one, and this is the one you're going to listen to from now on. Now, why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John, and not the rest of the disciples? Well, they were sort of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. These would be the ones who would be the most influential in the early church. Now, we know that God does not play favorites, but whatever reason, God chose them to be with him in certain special situations. Those who are most devoted to Jesus, and what I get out of this, is those who are most devoted to Jesus are the ones who are going to experience a deeper intimacy with him. Remember now, Jesus' ministry up to this point was to move his disciples from focusing on the law and the prophets to focusing on himself. He wanted them to see the grace and the truth in place of the law and the prophets. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said this, I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose and to fulfill them. So this is really interesting. Jesus fulfilled the law. The ceremonial part of the law, Jesus became the final sacrifice. The judicial part of the law, Jesus is the righteous judge. And the moral part of the law, Jesus is the sinful, sinless man. And then Jesus not only fulfilled the law, but Jesus fulfilled the prophets. The coming of the Messiah was prophesied, and Jesus has come. He is the Messiah. The prophets talked about the judgment of sin, the final judgment of sin, and Jesus took it all, took all the sin of the world, and paid the price, and accomplished forgiveness of all sin for all time. And the prophets talked about the dwelling of God in men. And Jesus today inhabits believers through the Holy Spirit. In Luke 16 and verse 16, Jesus said this, Until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the message of the prophets were your guides. Until John the Baptist, he said. But now, he goes on to say, But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. Remember what the Father said at the Transfiguration. He said to the disciples, your, your authority, your guide, is now my son Jesus, and you need to be listening to him. You need to hear what he has to say. This is the new covenant teaching of Christ. So the Father sets Jesus apart from and above the law and the prophets. Jesus is transfigured, he is glorified, and his divine nature, the fact that he is God incarnate, God in the flesh, is clearly revealed and it is affirmed by the Father. Right after the Father says, listen to my son, what happens? Moses and Elijah disappear, leaving only Jesus in his transfiguration, in his glory. Now the Father has shown the law and the prophets as being blessed and essential to bring mankind to this place in history. But they are now superseded by Jesus. The ministry of the law and the prophets is still active, but only to, the, to point out man's utter failure through the law and man's glorious hope in Jesus Christ through the prophets. 
So note this. Jesus' transfiguration is not only for Jesus, but it's for all who are born again. Now we are set apart from the law and the prophets, just as Jesus was, in the grace of God. The law and the prophets no longer can make demands and requirements of us. We're totally free from them, and we're free to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit who lives within every believer. So we have received in Christ the Spirit and the character and the life of God himself. And we have an inner glow. We don't, <laughs> we don't glow visibly, but we have an inner glow that reveals Jesus to this dark world. Now, remember what Peter said. He said, let's build monuments. Let's build a shelter for these three men and let's stay up here for a long time. Let's, let's not go anywhere else. But Jesus immediately took them back down into the valley where they encountered a demon-possessed boy and they healed him. Now, religion in, the, in today's world, religion continues to build monuments to Jesus, monuments to Moses, monuments to the prophets, monument after monument, and multitudes of believers camp out at those monuments. God does not want us to camp out. Our work is in the demon-possessed valley. That's where the real work of the gospel. So Jesus will give us mountaintop experiences. Yes, he will. And then right away he will say, now let's take this mountaintop experience down into the valley where there are people who need to hear the gospel. The valley is where we are transfigured. The valley is where the power of Christ comes through. The valley is where people actually hear the Father say, listen to what this person is saying. This is my voice to you. And we can make a real difference in people's lives. The average person, the average believer doesn't preach from a pulpit. The average believer preaches with his life and with his words of encouragement and wisdom and correction whenever it's necessary. Look at Romans chapter 4. No, pardon me, chapter 7, <laughs> verse 4. He says, So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, here now, now here's, the, here's, the, here's the final point here. Here's the bottom line. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Only as a result of our having been born again. Only as a result of our being united with Christ. Now these good deeds that uh, uh, Paul writes about here, they don't come from working hard to produce something for the kingdom of God. They don't come from trying harder. That's not good news, that we have to continue to try harder and try harder, which is what many church organizations press on their people. In Matthew 11, Jesus said this, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. The teaching I'm giving you, that's easy to understand. It's easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. You're just going to work with me and I'm going to do most of the work. That's what Jesus says. And this is the gospel. That's the good news. It's our message for, to the world and to believers who are, who are buried in religion. It says, rest from knocking yourself out and working hard to please God. Rest from the burden of the laws and the rules and the regulations and the requirements. Experience freedom from fear and guilt and uncertainty about the future. Rest in me, says Jesus, and we'll work together. So Jesus fulfills all the promises of Moses and the prophets. And so the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Maybe, like Herod, 
you've heard about him and you're curious about him, but you're not sure really who he is. Or you think Jesus might be a reincarnation of Moses or one of the prophets or an angel. Or he just might be an exceptional man. Perhaps you're like Peter and you do recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. And Peter said rightly who Jesus was, but he still had misconceptions about the Messiah because he expected him, just like many Jews, to come and conquer Rome and set the Jewish people free from bondage. He even, Peter even denied that he knew Jesus when the pressure was on and Jesus was being sentenced, he was being tried. Out of fear for his own life, he denied that he even knew Jesus Christ. Now none of this, none of these ideas about who Jesus is will set you free as God intended you to be set free, or to bring the rest that God promised to us. Peter only understood the full mission of Christ after the resurrection, the ascension, when Jesus ascended into heaven, and Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples in the upper room. Church, that's where we live today. We live after Pentecost. We live in Christ, we who have been born again. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, just as they were on the day of Pentecost. No difference. And the new covenant is a covenant of grace. And it comes as a rest covenant. It's a seventh day covenant. After creation, what did God say? He said, it's finished. On the cross, just before Jesus died, what did he say? It is finished. The work is done. And so God ushered in, in Christ, a new rest covenant. So people ask Jesus, what should we do to do the works of God? They were eager to do the works of God. Most believers are eager to do the works of God, and they, and they some, sometimes scramble to find things to do. Keep the Big Ten, is that what we're supposed to do? Win the world for Jesus? Uh, travel to Africa as a missionary? Do more good than bad so the scale is weighted in our favor? Come on, Jesus, tell us what to do. Well, here's what Jesus told them in John chapter 6. This is the only work God wants you to do. Wow. Believe in the one he has sent. Believe in his son. Believe in me, said Jesus. Believe in me. And when we say, yes, that's what I'll do, then the devil comes right along, just like he did in the garden, and says, did God really say, just believe? Oh, no, no, no. You've got to do more. You've got to do better. You've got to try harder. You've got to just do it. What this does for a believer then causes doubt and uncertainty. Wait a minute, have I done enough? Have I done the right thing? Is, is what I have done, is it acceptable to God? Uh, what should I do next? And, and probably just as important, what should I stop doing? Is God mad at me? Is he going to punish me when I do wrong? So instead of entering into his rest, we in enter into restlessness and fear and feelings of guilt. We carry false burdens because we're believing a lie that we must do things to please God. His grace says this, stop trying so hard to change. Stop trying so hard to do things. Just work with God. Let God bring the change in your life. So we really, as believers, the Bible tells us we've got nothing to complete because Jesus has completed everything necessary for our salvation, for a godly lifestyle, and for entry into his kingdom. The Bible says we are complete in him. Colossians 2 and verse 8 says this, 
Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world. You see, human thinking has created religion. The spiritual powers of this world have created a wrong idea about the Christian life. These things come about, it says, other places than from Christ. For in Christ, goes on to say in Colossians 2, in verse 9, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in the human body. All the fullness of God is in Christ because Christ is God. So, verse 10, you also, speaking to believers, you also are complete through your union with Christ. In other words, in you, the work is finished. Once you're born again, once you're saved. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. It also says in 2 Peter 1, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need, everything we need for living a godly life. And in Hebrews 10, by one offering, Jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If you're born again, that's you and me. He has perfected us forever. And we're in the process of maturing. We're in the process of growing. The Bible calls that a sanctification process, but it's not required for our salvation. It just happens because that's what we want. So a, a true understanding of God's grace will always, always lead to righteous living. It won't lead to licentiousness, which is sort of like living, running wild, just doing whatever we want. It won't, it will lead to, it will lead to productive activity. We'll be doing good things. We'll be doing the right things. We'll be producing for the kingdom of God. It won't lead Grace does not lead to laziness and inactivity. When do we sleep best? When do you sleep best? Well, I don't know about you, but I sleep best when all the turmoil is settled in my mind and in my heart. When I'm at rest, when I've got that inner peace that comes from knowing that I am truly secure in Christ. Oh, I may regret some of the things I did or said during the day, and I, I may be a little concerned about the next day, but when I really come to that realization of who Christ is, his glorified Christ, and who I am in him, with him living in me in the person of the Holy Spirit, you see, if you're looking for a mountaintop experience, now listen to me. If you're looking for a mountaintop experience, you've already got it. You're already there. Wow. It's already there. And enjoy the ride. Trust me, it's never boring. You probably already figured that out. That our life in Christ is never boring and often challenging and, and quite often frustrating sometimes, but it's never boring. It's always busy. And one day, one day, every believer will have a glorified, transfigured body just like Jesus. And the Bible says this, great is your reward. Let's pray. Father, what a great story about the glorifying of Jesus Christ, about the transfiguring of Jesus Christ, superseding all the law and all the prophets and making us complete and giving us everything we need for, for Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to see that clearly. Holy Spirit, please uh, point us to Jesus. Help us to see him in all his glory. Help us to see all the glory that he has in us. And then Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us and, and show us the things that we must do in order to fulfill everything God has for us not in our own strength, not by trying harder, 
but simply by resting in Him and being obedient to your leadership. So thank you, Father. Lord, I pray for those who are secluded, feeling isolated, suffering through all of the, the quarantines, uh, the COVID-19 crisis that we're going through. Father, you are with us in the midst of all of this. And you will see us through to glory. We look forward to being of use to you, even in the midst of this seclusion. Help us to reach out to people in any way we can to let them know that you're the source of all love and anointing and power. So we look forward to a great time ahead with you, Lord. Amen. And I look forward to seeing you again next week, perhaps this Sunday you'll tune in. God bless you all.